Hello everyone, welcome to this new message. Let's begin by committing the time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being able to come boldly into your presence. Thank you for your precious word. And we pray that as we read it and hear it, that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit into all truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, welcome again, brothers and sisters, to this new message. Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. We're going to be reading from verse 15 down to verse 22. Matthew 24. Verses 15 to 22. When you're there, let's read together. Matthew 24, verse 15. Here we go. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor never shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, there we are. There's a, a passage of scripture from the Gospel of Matthew that I'm sure many of you have read and heard before. And I've called this message, What Has Been Shall Be Again. What Has Been Shall Be Again. And I hope that you will see why as we draw to the end of this message. Now there have been, as you will no doubt know, many sermons, as I've said, brought on this particular chapter. However, it's always been a concern to me as to the various sets of belief there are as to the last two verses of our text today. And it's to those that we will focus on later on in this message. The times that we live in are growing spiritually darker by the day, I'm sure you'll agree. Yet there still seems to be some confusion or at least some difference of opinion as to what the church will face, if anything, in the last days prior to Jesus' return for his bride, the church. Now this is a shame really because there's quite a lot of information throughout scripture to help us all to understand if we would just study it. Sadly, for the most part, very little has been or is being taught from the pulpit about this subject in order to prepare the believers for the last days. I hope that through this study of our text today, you who are listening will be somewhat more prepared for what is to come for the body of Christ. First of all, I believe that we should establish whom these prophetic words of Jesus are speaking to. By that I mean, is it merely for the Jewish believers? Or is it also for the Gentile believers? I want to emphasise here, brothers and sisters, that there are indeed specific promises and covenants in Scripture 
which are entirely for the Jewish people alone and not for the church, the body of Christ. For example, number one, the Jewish people were and are the chosen by God. They are the people chosen by God and belonging to God the Father. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2 says this. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2. Thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So the Jewish people are chosen by God the Father and they belong to him and still do. Secondly, the land of Israel was given to the Jewish people forever, not to the church. It was given to the Jewish people. Genesis chapter 13 verse 15. Genesis chapter 13 verse 15. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. Now thirdly, there would always be a seed of David upon the throne. There would always be a seed of David upon the throne. Second Samuel chapter 7 verses 15 and 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 15 and 16. But mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house, speaking of David, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. The seed of David. And fourthly, there are more, but we'll limit it to these. Fourthly, God promised to restore Israel as a nation in her own land. For this, we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 to 36. Here we go. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. For those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the last least of them Unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me for ever. Now as I've said, these covenants and promises and others are by God and to the Jewish people alone, not to the church, the body of Christ. We need to understand that. There are those things that are indeed promised to the church, which, by the way, is made up of both Jew and Gentile. The church, the body of Christ, is, we must remember, made up both of Jew and Gentile. We'll look now at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first 
and also to the Greek. Nevertheless, who is it that Jesus is speaking to in our text today? Well, it's obvious that he is speaking to the apostles and disciples that were following him. These are the very men who, in Acts chapter 2, would be the first or core members of the newly birthed church, the body of Christ, which, as we have already seen, would be made up both of Jew and Gentile. Remember Romans 1 verse 16, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Now, I want you to notice that the word Greek in Romans 1 verse 16 is uh, the Greek word Helan, Helene, Helene, which is used of a person of Greece or more widely for a non-Jew or a Gentile. So it's broadly speaking a Gentile. Okay? So it's to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, the non-Jew. Therefore, what Jesus is speaking prophetically in our text is aimed at the whole church, the body of Christ, because it involves his own coming again. And he's coming again for his church, his body, his bride. So let's look then at what it is that's being said. In the verses up to verse 14, Jesus is outlining some of the things that will happen leading up to the end and things to be on the lookout for, to be alert for, signs if you like, that we can tell by that the end is drawing near. Now when it comes to our text, Jesus becomes more specific about certain things that will occur prior to his coming again for his bride. And this is what we're going to study today because we are growing closer by the day to this time where Jesus will return. I hope you will agree with that. Now after Jesus has shaken the disciples, as it were, out of their focus that was on the buildings around them and told them, about some of the things that would occur during the last days, he says the following in verse 15. Let's read it again together. Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. First of all, Jesus is here quoting from the book of Daniel. We know that because he actually tells us so in the verse. <clears throat> he says, whomso readeth, let him understand. So I think that would be a good idea for us to do as Jesus suggested and read a little from where he quotes. So turn with me please to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know you therefore, and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild, and to build, sorry, Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall 
even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant, the covenant, sorry, with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now this is the first occasion where Daniel mentions the coming abominations and desolation. There are two other occasions which we'll look at next. The second time is in Daniel chapter 11 verses 30 to 32. Let's read it together. Daniel chapter 11 Verses 30 to 32. Verse 30. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelli intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Now that's the second time it's mentioned and the third time is in the next chapter, Daniel chapter 12. Now we're going to read from verse 8 to verse 13. Daniel chapter 12 from verse 8 to verse 13. Let's read together. Verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate, desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest and stand in the lot at the end of the days. In thy lot at the end of the days. Now it's really this third occasion that I would like us to look at a little bit closer. Notice, if you will, what the prophet Daniel says in verse 8. Right back in Daniel, in, uh, Daniel chapter 10, Daniel tells us that he had been in prayer and fasting for three weeks. And when the angel Gabriel came to him and began to expound to him, of many of the events of the last days. When Gabriel had finished, he tells Daniel the following. Now this is Daniel chapter 12 verse 4. But thou, Daniel, thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel then sees two men by the river, and he asks one of them when these things shall be. He's told the following in Daniel 12, verse 7. 
And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and an half, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the people, of the holy people, sorry, all these things shall be finished. Now Daniel's response to this is interesting. I'll read it to you again in verse 8 of Daniel 12. Daniel 12 verse 8. This is Daniel's response. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall the end of these things be? And Daniel had already been told to seal up the book until the time of the end, but was eager to know more. He was naturally inquisitive, wasn't he? However, he is told in no uncertain terms to go away. We'll read this in Daniel 12, verse 9. Daniel 12, verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now this is literally what the Hebrew word halak means. This was something in the plans and purposes of God which was to be hidden until the time of the end. Go thy way is the Hebrew word halak and it virtually means go away. It is a little like the answer that the disciples got from Jesus, isn't it? In Acts chapter 1 verse 7. Let's read that together. Acts chapter 1 verse 7. Let's read together. And he said, that's Jesus, un and he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Virtually the same sort of answer from Jesus, isn't it? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own power. In other words, go away and do what you're told. Nevertheless, brothers and sisters, as we now return to our text for today, being hopefully aware that we are actually living in the last days, more and more will gradually be opened to us as to the meaning of such scriptures as these in the book of Daniel. As we draw nearer to that time, the Lord will reveal more of what these scriptures mean. Jesus himself in Matthew 24 verse 15 has, as we've seen, warned us to be aware of what was prophesied in Daniel of these times. So then we must understand what has been said. I think that makes sense, doesn't it? If Jesus has warned us, to be aware of what these prophetic words in Daniel are, then we must understand what's been said. I think that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So then, as I said earlier, after setting out many of the events and signs, if you like, of the last days, Jesus begins to focus upon the period warned of in the scriptures in the book of Daniel. In other words, the last days, namely the period prophetically called the week, which was mentioned in the first of the three portions of Daniel that we read. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We'll read it again. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now the week, which is used in this verse, 
means a period of seven years prophetically, as it is used in Scripture. It's prophetic of seven years. Seven days is a type or a shadow, if you like, prophetically of seven years. Therefore, in our text from verse 15 onward, Jesus is speaking prophetically of this period. And what those in the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, who are living and alive through this time, can expect to encounter. When Jesus speaks in verse 15, then, he's taking for granted, now listen to me, he is taking for granted that there will be at least some of the church, the body of Christ, the bride, there, alive, in Jerusalem at the time of the Antichrist, when he is revealed, and when he sets up the abomination that causes desolation in the temple, as you will see when we read it again. Matthew 24, verse 15, once again. When you therefore shall see, see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place, whomso readeth, let him understand. Important words, brethren, we need to understand them. Now, then these may all be Jewish believers in Yeshua, or they may be Jew and Gentile. We're not told here. However, when the Antichrist and his system are in control globally, what happens to the believers in Jerusalem will also be happening to believers everywhere else. We need to understand this. So let's continue. Next, Jesus gives a warning for all believers in Jerusalem. Oh, sorry, in Judea. He gives a warning for all the believers in Judea. We're going to read from verse 16 down to verse 20 now of Matthew 24. Verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, notice that Jesus warns those who are in Judea to flee to the mountains. I want you to remember that Jesus is still talking about believers here, born again believers who are in Judea at this time. He's telling them to flee to the mountains. Now there are many caves in the Judean mountains. It's where the young David, the prospective King David, hid from King Saul, if you remember. They're also warned to go straight there and not return home for anything. In other words, not to turn back. Now, this is a similar strict warning that was given to Lot and his family, wasn't it? Not to turn back. And now we come to the last two verses of our text today. Verses 21 and 22 of Matthew 24. Let's read them again to refresh our memories. Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. Verse 21, here we go. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But... For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now it's really 
these two verses that I want to focus the remainder of this message on. I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that at this time that Jesus is speaking of, when the Antichrist is revealed and his worldwide system is up and running, that all true believers everywhere will be affected. Jesus, now in verse 21, says that there shall be great tribulation. Now firstly, I have to say that this is not, and I repeat, this is not the wrath of God. Some people get this wrong. It says great tribulation. It's not the wrath of God. It's great tribulation. The Greek words that have been translated into English as great tribulation are the Greek words megas thlipsis. Megas thlipsis. Now megas means great of number and quantity, numerous, large or abundant. It's where we get the word mega from. Megas, great of number and quantity, numerous, large or abundant. And the word thlipsis, thlipsis, means the following, oppressing, oppressing together, a pressure, metaphorically oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, to be in straits. This great tribulation is, as I said, not the wrath of God, but rather the rage of the Antichrist and the devil against all who have bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and not done so to him or to them. It's the rage of the Antichrist and the devil against everyone who has bowed the knee to Christ. We're told that as believers in Christ that in this world we will have tribulation. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. These are very, very important matters to understand, brothers and sisters. We should not be under any misunderstanding here. John 16, verse 33. John 16, verse 33. Let's read together. These things I have spoken unto you. Jesus speaking here. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have what? Tribulation. Thlipsis. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah! Can I get an amen there, brethren? However, during this particular time, we will undergo great tribulation. Or I should say those who are alive at this time will undergo great tribulation. That means on an unprecedented scale. Matthew 24 verse 21 says this, for then shall be great tribulation, megas thlipsis, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. In fact, so bad will these days be for believers that if the days were not cut short by God, nobody would survive them. Nobody would survive them. What does it say in Matthew verse 22? Matthew 24 verse 22, sorry. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then you might be saying, okay, John, but what are you trying to say here? 
Well, what I'm trying to convey in this message, brothers and sisters, is that I know all of us here today may not be alive when this happens, when this all takes place. I also know that Jesus was speaking to Jewish believers in the main at the time. When this does happen, however, there may be or may not be Gentiles in Judea. However, what I do know is that at this time the devil, through the Antichrist, etc., will be in control of the whole world system. The whole world system. All over the world, everywhere. There'll be enormous pressure and persecution put upon all true believers in Christ Jesus. There is, for the benefit of those listening, who think that this prophetic word of Jesus is just for the Jewish people, an important word used by the Lord in verse 22. That word is elect. Elect. Remember that Jesus is speaking to his own disciples now, who are, yes, Jewish, but are also the core of what was to become the church, the body of Christ, in Acts chapter 2. This word elect is in fact the Greek word eklektos, eklektos, and it means picked out, chosen, chosen by God to obtain salvation through Christ. Christians are called chosen or elect of God. The Messiah is called elect as appointed by God to the most exalted office conceivable. It's the choice, the select, the best of its kind or class, excellence, preeminent, and it's applied to individual Christians. Eclectos, the elect, chosen, by God. This word, eclectos, is used 23 times in the New Testament in describing believers in Christ Jesus. Disciples, Christians, the body, the church of Christ, which is made up of both Jew and Gentile. I keep hammering that home, brethren. Here are a few examples of where it's used. First, we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Eclectos, there we are. Second Example is Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And it says this. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. The church of Colossae was a mixture of Jew and and Gentile. And finally, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Chosen there is our word eclectos, elect. 
What though, after all this, does the great tribulation have to do with us, you may say? Well, this is the point of the message and why it's entitled, What Has Been, Will Be Again. What I want to get across to everyone listening to this message is that the Bible is not just a record of how God has created, intervened and ultimately provided salvation for mankind. It includes that. But it's not only that. It also provides shadows, types or patterns, if you will, of what Jesus has been saying prophetically in Matthew 24, namely about the coming Antichrist. What does this mean? Well, throughout the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, according to Jewish thought, there have been many types or shadow figures of the eventual Antichrist. To explain, Pharaoh of Egypt was a definitive type of the Antichrist, if you will, by his attitude and his treatment of the Hebrew slaves. Nebuchadnezzar was yet another type or shadow of the Antichrist in his capturing of the Jews and the total destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Another one is Antiochus for Epiphanes. Antiochus for Epiphanes. He was another type of the Antichrist. His story can be found in one of the non-canonical books, not found in the normal Bible, but it's in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And this is a, a true account of um, Antiochus and what happened in Jerusalem. It is as a result of this man's actions that the Jewish feast of Hanukkah Hanukkah comes and it's a feast that Jesus took part in himself so I encourage you to read about that. Antiochus for Epiphanes was another type or shadow of the eventual Antichrist and as I said his account can be found in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. There have been many other smaller types, like King Saul, for instance, King Ahab, King Herod, and in more modern times, Adolf Hitler, of course, was a major type of the Antichrist. These are all types and shadows showing us in some way what the eventual Antichrist will be and what he will do. However, as I've said, all of these that I've mentioned are merely types or shadows of what is to come. They are, though, real warnings of the terror, the real terror that will come with the real Antichrist against the people of God. The destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD followed on only a generation from this prophetic warning of Jesus in our text today. That was not the end though, but that destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD is a, a major type of what is to come. The important thing to remember though is that there is going to be a terrible time for all believers when the real Antichrist is revealed. And according to Jesus' own words, those who are alive at the time in the body of Christ will see it. Matthew 24, 24 sorry, verse 21 again. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
Now I don't know personally when this will happen. I don't know when all of it will happen. Scripture tells us repeatedly to be ready. And that's all it tells us. To be ready. To be prepared for when it does. We may be here. We may not be. But there are going to be believers still here when it does happen. Contrary to what many think, in that the church will be taken before anything bad happens. Jesus, remember, himself said the following in verse 22 of our text in Matthew 24. Let's read it again. Matthew 24 verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So then, at whatever point we, the body of Christ, are taken through this time, we will see and experience some of the great tribulation. God will save us through the terror. He won't save us from it. He will save us through it, as he did with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego through the furnace. Do you remember? Jesus was with them in the furnace and brought them out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says the following. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Let's read together. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So in the end, brothers and sisters, we need to remember that the Bible is there for us to learn from. As I have shown you from Scripture, there have been many types or shadows of what is to eventually come upon the earth, upon the world. So please remember that, as the title of this message says, what has been will be again. Jesus left us these warnings for a good reason. I believe he knew what was going to happen in 70 AD, and that maybe was one good reason for his warning in our text. However, the end has not come yet, brethren, but I believe that it soon will. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to be spiritually strong and trusting the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind and with all our soul. Put on the full armour brothers and sisters, and keep it on. And when you see these things happen, remember what is said in the Gospel of Luke in the following scripture. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. Let's read together. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise his holy name. So then, my dear brothers and sisters, until the next time, God willing, may God richly bless and keep you. Amen.